So we've reached chapter 12 and chapter 13 of the book of Exodus, um, and we've reached the, the evening of the most significant salvation event in the whole of the Old Testament. The Lord is about to strike Pharaoh and strike Egypt with this 10th plague, which is going to be so severe that Pharaoh is not just going to let God's people go after all these years in slavery. He's going he's to tell them to get out of Egypt. He's going to drive them away um, in the middle of the night, in haste, in a hurry to their freedom after all this time, slavery and oppression and having their infants thrown into the Nile. They will be free this very night. Um, Exodus 12, Exodus 13, this, uh, this, this very significant night for the people of God in Egypt, we read that about midnight, the Lord uh, went out into Egypt and all the firstborn of Egypt died. Uh, people, animals, they died. But all the Israelites, they were kept completely safe. Do you remember last week, if you were with us, how, how they were kept safe, how they were protected? They took a lamb, a little lamb, without blemish, uh, and they killed it, and they roasted it, and they ate the meal together in their house, and they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home, and God's people were perfectly safe. They, they found a perfect refuge sheltered under that blood. And we read in the text that that very night, Pharaoh, he rises up in the night and the land is full of wailing and Pharaoh's firstborn son is dead and he summons Moses and Aaron. He doesn't wait till the morning. He summons them there and then and he tells them and all of God's people to go and to serve the Lord. Finally, he's come to recognize who Yahweh is, that Yahweh is God, Yahweh is Lord. He's forced to bow the knee. He's forced to obey him. He's forced to recognize him. And so we read in chapter 13 that the people left Egypt quickly. They took their dough with them before it was leavened, before it had put any, any yeast in it. And the Egyptians who were, were filled with fear, they gave them gold and silver jewelry and clothes. And the Israelites that night, they, they took all of these things. They took their kneading bowls wrapped up in their cloaks. They took all of their cattle. And that night, they left Egypt after 430 years of living in Egypt. At last, they were free. They'd been delivered by the Lord their God. And right in the middle of this incredible narrative in the, the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, we find ourselves in this very careful set of instructions. Instructions that the Lord gives to Moses and Moses passes on to the people and these instructions are to be kept for the future generations of Israel, are to, to keep these instructions and they're all about how to celebrate the Passover meal and the feast of unleavened bread so that they never forget, never forget what the Lord did to deliver them from Egypt that night. The month of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it became the first month of the calendar year for Israel. We read in chapter 12 that on the 10th day of that month, they were to take a lamb out of the flock, one year old, a male without blemish, take it out on the 10th day, on the 14th day of the month, the whole nation was to, to slaughter the lamb at twilight. Uh, and um, that first Passover meal while they were in Egypt, they were to put the blood on the doorposts. They were to eat the meat. They were to roast it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The meat had to be kept in the house. No bones of, of the, the lamb or the kid, it could be a kid, uh, was to be broken. Um, and any meat that was left over at the end, they had to burn it in the morning and make sure that it was all consumed. They were to eat this meal with their belt fastened and with their sandals on their feet and their staff in their hand, ready, ready to leave 
ready to leave Egypt trusting the Lord and what he said, ready to leave obeying the Lord. This was the Passover meal which we looked at last week. This vivid picture of the gospel, our gospel that we believe, a picture um, of the ultimate salvation, the ultimate deliverance that the Lord God would accomplish on our behalf through the death of his son on the cross um, so that we can experience God's mercy and eternal life. Now, hand in hand with this Passover meal went the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is what we're thinking about today. For seven days after the Passover meal, the people of Israel were not allowed to eat any, kind, any other bread except for unleavened bread, bread without yeast. On the first day of those seven days, they had to remove all the yeast from their homes and uh, from their borders. No yeast was to be found anywhere. And on that first day, the people would assemble together uh, for worship. And they would do the same on the seventh day at the end of this, this feast and festival as well. Everyone was to rest on those two days, the first of the seven days, the last of the seven days. No work to be done except to prepare food and eat together. And there was a feast on the, on the seventh day. It was a time of celebration. And yet it was also, it was also serious. If anyone did eat any food during those seven days which had yeast in it, they were to be cut off. They were to be cut off from Israel, cut off from the people. Why did the Lord command them to keep this feast of unleavened bread every year along with the Passover meal? What is its significance? Well, we read in chapter 12, verse seven, the Lord tells Moses, Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. And then in chapter 13, verse three, we read, then Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. It was to be a memorial. It was to be a lasting ordinance so that they would always remember and never forget that awesome night when they came out of Egypt. The Lord delivered them from the land of slavery, and in haste they came out of Egypt and were free to be God's holy people. God's holy people. God's people so easily take for granted or forget the great things that the Lord God has done for them. So easy, isn't it, to forget them, to to take them for granted. Our hearts go grow cold over the wonderful things that the Lord has done for us. And so the Lord gave them this feast to help them always remember, always celebrate, always to continue to experience by faith this great salvation he accomplished for them in Egypt. But this is the really significant thing about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the thing I want you uh, to take away and remember and ponder and think about this week. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was a reminder to Israel, not just that the Lord had delivered them, not just that that God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. It was to remember that they had been delivered in order to be brought into new life with God. They had been delivered from Egypt in order to be brought into new life with God with God. They had been set free by the Lord in order to become a holy nation. This was now their identity. This is, God had saved them to become a holy nation, a people set apart by God, for God, in order to bless the whole world. Later we read um, that the Lord carried them that night. He carried them out of Egypt on eagle's wings and brought the people to himself, carried them on eagle's wings, brought them to himself so that they could serve him. Pharaoh, Moses told Pharaoh that's why he needed to let them go, 
so that the people could go and have a festival and worship and serve the Lord. And Pharaoh recognized that, and that night he said, go, go and serve Yahweh. This was the Lord's purpose. They weren't just delivered by the Lord from Egypt that night. They also took their first steps, their first steps into the freedom and the joy of being God's redeemed holy nation. This was their new identity. They were a holy, they were now a holy nation. God was gonna show them his mercy and his love. He was gonna, he was, is going to uh, give them his law, teach them how to live together as his people. He's gonna give them the closeness of his presence in the tabernacle. He's gonna lead them all the way to the promised land and there they would experience his blessing and his favor. This was their new identity. But to experience this, to be part of this, this great salvation, not only did God's people need to be taken out of Egypt, but Egypt had to be taken out of God's people. They'd been living there for immersed in this this way of life for over 400 years. Um, and the way God delivered them through these 10 plagues, part of the, that was purposeful. There's purpose in the way God delivered his people through these 10 plagues. And we looked at this two, two sermons ago. Through these 10 plagues, the Lord judged the gods of Egypt. He judged the gods of Egypt. In other words, through these 10 plagues, the Lord showed everyone the foolishness of worshiping idols. The foolishness of worshiping the gods of, of this age. Because outwardly, Egypt was such an impressive place, wasn't it? And we still see the remains of it today in archeology. span So rich, so much power, such a powerful nation. So outwardly, very, very shiny. But underneath, Egypt was a, a culture of death and oppression and violence and greed. And these plagues, they purged the minds of Israel to show them that living for the gods of Egypt, living for idols, living for the, the, the things of this world and replacing the Lord, the true God, the one true God who created them and loves them, that way of life is always gonna lead to decay. It's always gonna lead to death. It's always gonna lead to ruin. They were to come out of Egypt. They were to come out of Egypt and be God's new people, a holy nation. God's people have been immersed in the Egyptian worldview and this, this way of life oppressed by the people for hundreds and hundreds of years. But now the Lord was redeeming them. He was bringing them out. He was purging their minds of that Egyptian way of life through the plagues. He was showing Israel that life without him, life rejecting him is, is dreadful. But to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to belong to the Lord, to worship the Lord as we're doing this evening, our maker, our redeemer, the one true and living God, that is true freedom. That is true joy. That is true life. Uh, this was why this Passover month with the Feast of Unleavened Bread became the first month of the calendar year for the Israelites um, because it was a new beginning. They were new creations called out of Egypt to live new lives for the Lord. They'd been uh, brought out of Egypt, these people, into being taken into the promised land, out of darkness into God's light, out of death into life, out of slavery into freedom. And so now they were to live as a holy nation, redeemed by the Lord, set apart, belonging to him. They were to be unleavened in their lifestyle, in their relationships with one another in their community. In ancient times, when people made bread, they would uh, scoop out a lump of the leavened dough, 
um, with the yeast in it. So they'd make their bread with the yeast in it. They'd scoop out a lump, they'd put it to one side, and with this, they'd make their bread, and put it in the ovens, and it would rise up, and they'd eat it. And then the next day, they'd get that lump of, of bread with leaven in it, they'd add it to the new batch, and the yeast would spread through that new, new batch of dough, then they'd scoop out a lump again, put it to one side, their bread would rise in the oven, and they'd eat their bread, and so on and so on. They'd keep repeating that. Um, And in the Bible, usually when you read about yeast and when you read about leaven, in the Bible, it's often an illustration of how sin spreads. Have you noticed that as you read, read the scriptures? Or hypocrisy. Um, how sin spreads and how it contaminates things. Not all the time that, that yeast is used. It's also used, Jesus talks about, uh, compares the kingdom of God to yeast and how that spreads in a good way through the world and the kingdom of God spreads. But usually in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, yeast uh, is an illustration of how sin spreads and contaminates things. How sin can contaminate a community how sin can contaminate people's lives. And so this feast of, of unleavened bread, this feast of, of, um, with, where they would only eat bread without yeast, this kind of this sweeping out the yeast from your houses, this clearing out of yeast, this discarding the old lump, getting rid of it, throwing it away now, we're not going to use it, um, getting rid of that old lump. It was a reminder to Israel of their new beginning that night, delivered to be a holy nation. It was a picture of living the new life they'd been saved into. They were to get rid of the idolatrous ways of Egypt from their minds and from their lives. They were to have no more to do with that. They were to radically cut sin out of their lives uh, and be a holy nation set apart for God. They were to to be that people they were that night when they were delivered. So quick to trust the Lord and obey the Lord and leave Egypt that very night. So quick to trust him and obey and leave. And they were to live that way all of their lives. And they were to do it in a response to God's love for them and this great deliverance that he'd accomplished on their behalf. But how does all of this apply to you? How does this apply to me? What's this got to do with us today? Just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now the church in Corinth, as lots of you will probably know, was a messy church. Um, They were boastful, very proud, puffed up, and they were loveless. You know that famous 1 Corinthians 13? because they were such a loveless church. People were falling out. Christians, brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, quarreling. And immorality and worldliness had crept into this church and it was spreading um, because these believers were not even convicted. They weren't even distressed uh, by some of the scandalous things that were happening in their church life. They thought they were great. They had no desire to live as a holy nation and to act different from the world around them. And in chapter five, Paul is addressing a scandal in the church. Something going on in this church in Corinth that was so immoral, it was shocking to the Roman pagan society that they lived in. Um, You read at the start of chapter five, a church member was sleeping with his father's wife in this church. Um, And then you read, as you you look through the the early verses of chapter five, that they were proud about it. They weren't distressed by it all. Paul tells them, you should be mourning. You should be putting this man out of your fellowship in order that he might come to his senses uh, and repent from his sin Seek the Lord's help to change and be restored to you as a brother. And then Paul writes this to them. Just have a look down in verses six to eight. This is what Paul writes to them. He says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast 
leavens the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, yeast is so minute, isn't it? It's so tiny, you can barely see it. And, and Paul says, in the same way, just a little bit of, of yeast leavens a whole loaf, a whole batch of dough. He says, so blatant, unrepentant sin. That's a better way of putting it. So unrepentant sin spreads through a church, and before you know it, the church is puffed up into this loaf of bread. Paul warns them to be careful of this. And and as you read the letter, you discover Paul has written to them about these things before. Um, But their attitude is just proud, boastful, tolerant. Um, We don't care about it. And so the apostle tells them, this man, he needs to be taken out of church membership. He needs to be separated from the batch so the yeast of his sin doesn't spread through the body tainting their worship and their witness as a church. Uh, The aim of removing him from membership is so that this man would be wakened up to his sin and repent and be restored, restored to the Lord, in a right relationship with the Lord again, and restored to the body. That's the aim of removing him. The other aim is that the whole church should be an unleavened loaf of bread set apart for God, set apart for God's service. It's not possible, is it, in this world for a church to be a sinless community? Far from it. Um, We are all still sinners. We all fail in areas, some of the areas that Paul highlights in this chapter, in this letter, is sexual temptation, sexual purity, greed, idolatry, slander, gossip, drunkenness, cheating, pride, lovelessness, quarreling, falling out in the church. The difference is in the body of Christ, Paul is saying we should be distressed by our sin We should be turning to the Lord in honest confession of sin and repentance. We should be seeking the Holy Spirit's ministry in our hearts to help us, to help us to say no to the old worldly ways that we used to live in and to live set apart lives for God. Honest, humble repentance. That's how we get rid of the old leaven as a church. Honest, humble repentance, dependent on the Holy Spirit to help us to grow and to make progress. Listen again to how Paul words this. He words this very, very carefully in verse 7 and very powerfully. He says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Ebenezer Church is an unleavened loaf of bread. That is who you are. Because Jesus Christ died as your Passover lamb to cleanse you from your sin and to make you holy and blameless in his sight. You you are a holy nation. That is who you are. You have to accept your identity by faith in Christ You are part of God's holy nation. You really are. So put away the old ways. Be a person who is quick to repent. Quick to pray to God for help to live a new life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Quick to be humble and dependent upon God and his grace to help you live a holy life. This is how 
we get rid of the yeast of, of sexual immorality and greed and idolatry and slander and drunkenness and stealing and self-righteous hypocrisy and quarreling by remembering who we really are in Christ Jesus, praying for the Spirit to help us live out our new identity. How was Paul gonna help this church in Corinth? So puffed up, puffed up in the sense of all this yeast and all this messiness and all this sin and all this immorality and all this bickering and quarreling and lovelessness. How is Paul gonna help them? Pastorally, how is Paul gonna help them? Well, one very practical and pastoral thing Paul wants them to get right in this church is the Lord's Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. If they can do that in the right way, in a godly way, it will help them. It will help them as a church. Um, Communion. Communion is our meal. It's our memorial feast. And it's a powerful tool of transformation in the church. The way to avoid becoming a quarreling and immoral, puffed up body is to do what Paul tells us to do in chapter 11, verse 28. He tells us in chapter 11, verse 28, when you take the Lord's Supper, everyone, everyone, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. If everyone is doing that in a church regularly around the Lord's table, confessing and repenting of sin, remembering the sacrificial death of Christ for us in his grace, and examining their hearts, it's a powerful thing to do in the body of Christ. This is very different from self-righteous moral policing in in the church. We're not called to self-righteous moral policing. We are called to judge one another in the church. Um, But this is a a very powerful thing to do as a church together. To examine our hearts. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, while he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples, he took a loaf of unleavened bread. It was unleavened. And so he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the unleavened bread reminds us of the uncorrupted, sinless body of Christ. He was always quick to trust his Father, always quick to obey God's will. He never let the corruption of the world spread into his own life. He never let immorality in. He never let hatred in. Uh, He was a man of love. He kept his heart pure. And on the cross, Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, without any blemish, he bore our sin in his body. Our leaven, our leaven went into him and he became sin for us. He died for our sin in our place. And now, this symbol, the symbol of of this bread that we take, this unleavened bread that we eat, it's a reminder that we need to eat the true bread of life. That's what we most need, the true bread of life, Jesus Christ. We need to personally put our faith and our trust in him for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. We have been brought into the body of Christ. Ebenezer Church is unleavened bread set apart for God. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. When we come around this table, we examine ourselves. It's almost like we take a candle and we we go into the dark corners of our hearts and we, we sweep out the yeast that's there. We confess it to God. We bring it to him out into the open, into his light, knowing that the blood of Christ cleanses everything for us and if you feel overwhelmed this evening about doing that just start with one sin in your life 
Just one sin, one little area, one little room in your heart that you need to work on, that you need Christ's mercy and you need his help to change. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You don't need to be perfect to come to this table. You don't need to pass a morality test this week to come to this table. You just need to come believing that Jesus died on the cross for you, for your sins, and because of his death, you are now forgiven and holy and blameless and righteous in his sight. You just need to come believing he loves you. Examine your heart. Come in repentance and faith. The Lord Jesus loves you and he will help you. We're going to prepare to come to communion by singing together, Behold the Lamb. Um, It's the third song on your sheets.